Hello, this video is supporting the Dalriada topic from the Northern British context of the Advanced High History course. So far, uh, we have looked at the origins of the Dalriadans, where they from Ireland, or where they indigenous to Northern Britain. In this video, we're going to move on and look at the next section of this topic, which deals with the influence of Christianity upon the Dalriadans. Now before we begin, it's important to look at the background to Christianity and what's really going on within Dalriada in the 6th century. Now Christianity brought profound changes to the kingdoms of Northern Britain, Dalriada more than most. Christianity for Dalriada came out of Ireland. When the Romans fell back from Britain, Christianity seems to have largely disappeared with them, leaving Britain as a kind of largely heathen land after the Anglo-Saxons pushed in from Northern Europe and marginalised the Britons, who did incidentally hang on to their Christianity. Christianity, however, did thrive in Ireland, and it seems to be from these Irish roots that we see it coming across to Dalriada through their close contact with the Irish. Christianity brought with it the written word. Now, this is the huge difference between early Christianity and paganism, which it eventually marginalised and, and largely replaced. The Christians had the written word, they had Latin. Such a massive advantage over the pagans. They were able to record their ideas and share their ideas, whereas the pagans relied on word of mouth. Now, that written word in itself, over time, acquired a kind of magic of its own. It was kept by those who could understand it, those who could read it, essentially those who could write it. It put immense power into the hands of the church. The Christians also brought with them their own style of rich and complex artwork, which we're going to look at in more detail a bit later on in the course. They brought with them new and imposing buildings, not quite like the one we see in the slide here. This is the Benedictine Abbey that uh, came to Iona in the 11th to 12th century. Um, church buildings, however, were initially quite humble. Um, but over time, as the church managed to acquire money from secular rulers, then they invested that into their church buildings, which became a, a focus for religion, a focus for prestige and power. The church also had a role in kingship, inheritance and land ownership. Through inserting themselves into the, the secular nobility, into the power structures of the Northern British kingdoms, the, the church were able to generate massive quantities of wealth, which became a self-perpetuating cycle of generating power and prestige and keeping them at the top of society and making them an intrinsic part of what it meant to be a Dalriadan. The church also played a role in burial. The people adopted Christian burial practices because of the magic promise of Christianity. You follow their ways, you get a free ticket into heaven. You get to get out of the horrible struggle of this life you know, it's rigours and hardships and deprivations to a promised paradise in the other world as long as you follow the Christian rules. They also brought with them new artistic and farming technology. Now, Christianity brought with the enclaves of monks, specialists who dealt with religion, who would isolate themselves away from the rest of society and live in monasteries. Now, these monasteries became centres of learning, and out of that, they developed farming technologies to make the most of the land that had been given to them by the secular rulers. And then these technologies would filter down into the rest of society. So they became a driving force of learning as well as spiritual life. Now, moving on from the background, it's important to address the historical controversy of what was going on with Christianity in Dalriada during this period. In the 7th century, this historical controversy came to a head. In Britain, as I said earlier on, the, when the Romans left and fell away from Britannia and had to abandon it in the early 5th century, the Britons, the Romano-British, held on to Christianity, but they were within 30 or 40 years on their back foot and being pushed further and further west into the, the nether reaches of the British Isles by these invading Anglo-Saxons who brought with them their pagan religion. This meant that in 565, the Pope eventually tried to re-establish Christianity in Britain as he saw it as a kind of fallen, lost land. 
and he sent St. Augustine on a mission to re-Christianise Britain. Now, he landed in Kent and started to work his way or spread the word um, northwest across the island. And they brought with them the Roman idea of what it meant to be a Christian. Now, while they were doing their thing, Christianity had not died out in Ireland. And in fact, the Irish church and their ideas, in a way, having been cut off from Rome, represented a more old-fashioned, a more parochial, isolated version of Christianity that had developed in a separate way, remote from the power of the Pope. So over time, these two faiths individually thrived, and then they met. Now this happened during the 7th century at the court of the Northumbrian kings, where we had a situation where the Northumbrian king himself, uh, his kingdom had adopted the Irish church, the Irish version of Christianity, and his wife had come from the Roman Catholic version of Christianity. And there were differences between the two faiths. Now, in the next kind of couple of slides of the video here, we're going to look at what these differences were and what they could possibly tell us. So here we are. First up, is there a separate Celtic church? Some would argue yes. The Celtic church has its own sets of saints. In early Christianity, local areas are inclined to set up their own individual saints. This is about building up a local character of the church. This happens all across Britain. It really does happen on a large scale with the Irish church though. They have their own saints such as St Bridget, um, pictured here, and these we think are taken from pagan deities that the church has taken over. So they've made them safe by involving them into the Christian church rather than having them as rivals. Now obviously Celtic Irish based goddesses are not going to appear in the pantheon of the Roman church. So we have a bit of a contrast between two churches here. The Roman church is going to have its own separate set of saints that people are going to look to. Back in these times, the saints are seen as spokespeople who would speak up on your behalf with God. So early Christians would make offerings to saints, they would make promises to them, they would pray to saints, and the idea was that the saint would speak up on their behalf and help them to get into God's good graces, or help them to get what they wanted, or help them to get into heaven. So saints played an important role in society. A local saint then meant that there was a connection between your local area and the higher power. So they're important. So if we have two different sets of saints in the Celtic church and the Roman church, does that indicate that we have two separate churches on the go, two separate versions of Christianity? Some would argue that says yes. There are also different customs that are on the go too. The Irish Celtic church, the monks would often shave the front half of their head. So they would often, I guess, have a look of something like Bill Bailey, if you can picture him in your head. Poor Bill. Um, this was thought to mirror how the pagan priests at the time, or just before that time, the Druids, how they shaved their heads. Christianity is all about continuation. They understood very quickly that if you come in and you take over or destroy a people's holy places, holy personages, you are going to create a negative response. They're going to kick back. They're going to fight against you because they see themselves as being oppressed. You're coming in to take away what is valuable to them and what has been valuable to their ancestors for generations before. It's actually much easier to come in and take over these important things for people to appropriate them into this new idea. So you come in and you, you find these uh, holy personages, these holy people, these holy ideas, and instead of being horrible, terrible pagan gods that are going to burn their shrines down, they are adopted into the Christian church as saints. They may get slightly renamed, but you repackage them as something else and make it Christian rather than being pagan. Holy places, like the sacred groves or... Um, places in the landscape that the pagan gods would have required you to make sacrifices to, they're going to become holy wells or holy springs where a saint was said to have been once sort of drunk from and therefore it becomes okay to leave offerings there. Um, priests might build like a small chapel in a sacred grove for um, pagans. Now we see that kind of thing today in Loch Tay, admittedly not in Dalriada, but in kind of northeastern Scotland, 
Lotte, uh, just north of that, is a place called the Fortingall U. That is the oldest living organism in the British Isles, a yew tree that's said to be pushing on for, oh, off the top of my head, it's about 4,000 years old. Um, that would have been, we believe, a, a sacred Celtic grove. However, as the Christians come in, they adopt it and it becomes a Christian site. And then we have a saint associated with it as well. So that's an example there of how the Christian church takes over. Uh, pagan sites and makes them safe by making them Christian. So that's part of the argument that there's a separate church going on. Um, the other side of the argument here, no, there isn't a separate Celtic church, is that pagan practices continues alongside Christianity, as we've just been discussing. Some old traditions become part of the new Christian documents, um, but they appear distinct from Rome. So Ewan Campbell goes on to say, most scholars now reject the idea of a Celtic church, believing that there were differences of practice between all the churches in the Celtic areas, but they all regarded themselves as belonging to the standard Roman church of the continent. So given the chance, even these Celtic preachers would have travelled to Rome to see that centre of their religion uh, where the Pope sat and make a pilgrimage. So they don't see themselves as being isolated and different from it, but they may not be in regular contact with it, which allows their church to grow up and look different from what we see coming out of Rome at that time. So remember, as we are going through these videos, as with anything in the Advanced Higher Course, you want to be taking notes down from the, the monologue that's kind of come along with me, kind of chatting away in the background. If you're able to take down um, or print off a version of these slides as your core notes, if you annotate these notes as we go through and fill out the information so we can use it in essays and source questions. So let's move on. And all the historical controversy, Columba's achievements. Now, St. Columba is the, the vaunted figure. He is the figurehead, really, for the Celtic Church in Dariara. He is the big man. Why is this the case? Now, there are uncertainties about St. Columba. A bit of background about him. He comes to Dalriada in 563 AD, along with 12 disciples. He is all very much about show, so his 12 disciples is, is very much mirroring Jesus and his 12 disciples. He's bringing Christianity to a heathen land. Um, he comes and he lands in an island called Himba to him first. We think that apostle was Colonsy. And then he moves on and eventually settles in Iona which becomes the famous Christian heartland of the west side of northern Britain. So from Columba, this commune of monks um, grows and grows and thrives over the centuries afterwards and really does become the kind of Christian powerhouse of northern Britain. Columba is the man who began it all. So, uncertainties about him then. Columba, why was he exiled from Ireland? Now, anything that we're talking about in the 6th century AD is going to be a bit sketchy. This is really as far back as our written sources can stretch during this period. And we have to be a bit dubious about what does survive. Who's tampered with it over the years? How late after the events has it been written? From what we understand of St. Columba, he was part of one of the royal families of Northern Ireland. At this time, the island of Ireland is split into umpteen different individual minor kingdoms with all their own kings and princes, royal families and dynasties on the go, and they are continually struggling and fighting with each other for dominance. Columba was one of these princes. He wasn't directly in line to take the throne of uh, the kingdom uh, where he was based in the top end of the island of Ireland, but he manages to get himself involved in a struggle, a battle. Columba had turned to religion early on, not being the, the first son in the line, he needed to find a purpose. And he was educated by another saint, St. Finan. And it seems that there was a struggle over a holy book. Columba seems to have written a book which he copied from St. Finan. And St. Finan's followers in a rival kingdom took umbrage at this. They, well, first of a breach of copyright, eh? And um, it led to a war, a war between two kingdoms. And apparently hundreds of warriors were killed. The Columba felt so bad about this that he left Ireland and promised never ever to return. He couldn't bear the shame of it. He had to go. So he went into exile. Now that's the headline story. What the truth is behind that, who knows? 
perhaps Columba left because it was politically expedient for him to leave because there were a lot of people very, very angry with him. Um, perhaps Columba's faction lost that fight, that struggle for power. Um, the story of it being over a copy of a book might not be quite as straightforward and simple as that. Maybe uh, the real fight was over who was in charge of Christianity and religious power in that section of Ireland at the time, and Columbus faction lost, therefore had to leave. We're not entirely sure. And this is an example of some of the uncertainties we have of the origins of this great man. So as it goes on to say, was he a missionary or was he a hermit? Columba left Ireland and wanted to go into isolation. Now, the Bible was the inspiration for these early Christian types. And... There are loads of examples of early Christians in the Bible who went off to become hermits, to live alone, to live the ascetic lifestyle, minimal rations, no comforts at all, living in a cave in the desert in the middle of nowhere so that there's no distractions and you spiritually and mentally can get closer to that purity, that um, closer to that vision of being connected to your God. So we don't know, is Columba trying to do that? Is he leaving the population, the, the civilization that was on the go with his community in Ireland? And is he trying to find somewhere super isolated to go and lose himself? Is that why he's going out to Iona? Or is he going as a missionary? Is he going from this spiritual heartland of Ireland up into like their version of the Wild West, into the Western Isles of Northern Britain, to try and spread the word of Christianity? What is his purpose? Once again, we're not entirely sure there. There's a famous story of Columba during his career, his very, very long career. He was in Iona from 563 through to 597, so is that 34 years he's active there? A long time in this period. Um, one of the famous stories about him is that he did try to convert the people around about Iona. And um, one of the headline stories is he travelled up the Great Glen, so he landed in Appen near Fort William, and he would have made his way up uh, the Great Glen through past Loch Ness, where apparently he met the Loch Ness Monster, the first recorded event we have of the Loch Ness Monster popping up in history. Um, obviously, he sent the Loch Ness Monster on its way because he's an awesome, powerful saint. And then he gets to the north end of Loch Ness and he meets King Brady of the Northern Picts. And the story goes that he tried to convert him. Now, interestingly, the story has been taken at face value to say this happened. The purpose of the story is to say that Columba was accepted into Brady's court. This was a pagan court. He went head to head with Brady's Druid, um, the pagan version of what Columba was, I guess. And the Druid was quite rude to him, quite nasty to him. Um, and the story kind of like basically kind of leaves off there. It leaves the, the suggestion that Columba converted Brady. And it seems to be one of the strategies of the Christian church in Delria that was you went for the top, you went for the kings, you went for the nobles. When you got them, then all their followers started to convert to come across to Christianity to make sure they didn't fall out of the good graces of the nobles, which is actually a really, really very, very intelligent um, strategy by the church. Now, the Brady story leaves off there with the visit of Columba, the clash with the pagan priest, the pagan druid, and it kind of leaves it hanging as if, yes, of course, yeah, Brady was converted by Columba. That brought all the picks across to, to Christianity. But if you boil that story down, it doesn't actually say if Columba was successful. Did he actually convert Brady? Did Brady take him on? We're not sure. Where um, the Picts partly Christianized already before Columba got there? Where the Picts pagan for years after Columba left and it only happened later? We don't know. We just know that he went to go and see King Brady. But it has over time been held up as this massive conversion success story. So untruths about Columba. One of the big stories about Columba is that he played a huge political role. Now, he's said to have ordained King Aidan of Dalriada. Now, Aidan of Dalriada was the most successful, the most famous king of the Dalriadans. He took Dalriada from a fairly minor domain, basically kind of matches modern-day Argyll's boundaries, uh, that was seemingly under the heel possibly of its Irish connections um, just across the Irish Sea. Remember from our previous learning on Dalriada, we know that there's a controversy about whether or not the Dalriadans came from Ireland and migrated across the Irish Sea to settle in Argyll, or whether there were indigenous people who always lived in Argyll and just had really close contacts with the Irish rather than the North British um, neighbours and therefore kind of developed a different culture. So at the time that Aidan comes to the throne, 
there is a lot of influence from Ireland coming across the seas to to um, Argyle, Dalriada. And Aidan seems to break with that. So he, at a convention in Ireland, agrees independence for Scottish Dalriadan lands. Though obviously, Scotland's not a thing yet. Um, and then he, he goes for it. So he is campaigning with his armies up in the Orkneys. He's campaigning across the Pickland. He's campaigning as far south as Northumbria. Uh, we think he got as far down as Catrick, which is in one day Yorkshire. And by the time he got there, he had kind of hegemony. So he didn't outright own all of Northern Britain, but the kingdoms of Northern Britain acknowledged him, we think, as the supreme king or rule at the time. So he is in charge basically by 603 of almost half of the, the island of Britain, which is incredible for a kingdom the size of Argyll. So it pays for the Christian church to insert Columba into this legend almost of what Aidan achieved. And a biographer of Columba who's writing about him about 60 to 70 years after Columba died, he built in this story that King Aidan was crowned or ordained by Columba, and that seems to have been created. It seems to be made up. And we need to be careful about this. Lots of people use Columba as a tool. So a lot of what is written about him is to make someone else look better or to make the community Iona look better. We can't always rely on it as being fact. So Ewan Campbell goes on to say, Columba's life has been interpreted by many different people to support their own view of the past. His own biographer, Adomnan, is one of those people. We need to be careful what we read about Columba and really, really analyse it. Is it true? Is it actually fact? So having looked at about the kind of controversy of the origins of the church, what's going on, the kind of big powerful progenitor that starts it um, becoming a great big deal in Dalriada, uh, St Columba, we're now going to look on at the two impacts of the church on Dalriada society in the early medieval period and the two streams of their power. Now they, become, they become a massive, massive feature of what Dalriadan society and culture is. So this is the first aspect of how they managed to do that, the power of writing. So, before the Christians come along, pre-Christian knowledge. In Northern British pagan societies, knowledge comes from, and apologies for using the picture of the seer from the TV Viking show, um, he's a wee bit kind of hocus pocus and wizardy looking, but it kind of conveys the idea of what we're talking about here. Pre-Christian knowledge relies on those who could memorise large amounts of information. So we're talking about Druids really here. In Druid culture, they are seers, so they can see um, into the, the will of the gods. There's a bit of kind of mumble jumble going on there. They are that connection between ordinary people and the other side. So basically, what a priest offers you, connecting to God, connecting to, to heaven, to all the saints... Your druid is that uh, medium for you in this other religion. They are poets. Now, the um, we have a few pagan-based poems, I guess. Actually, probably it's a bit unfair to say they're pagan. We have some very early poems, such as the Godothan poem, which we think was written towards the end of the 6th century AD by Britons who, admittedly, yes, were Christian. Yes, that's a bad example. But it does set an idea of, we think this is how the Druids kind of remembered the tales of their people. Oral poetry, oral history. Now, it's not to say it's like poetry that you study in school nowadays. It might not always have a rhyming meter and so on, but they will remember a story of their people and they'll set it as a poem. Now, these poems would be recounted at feasts, festivals, uh, evenings in the Lord's Hall where um, everyone's in, carrying in around the fire. The Druid will stand up and he'll sing the poem of their people. This is how people remember stories of their past. This is how um, their identity is passed on from generation to generation. So these spiritual fellows, ladies even, uh, would memorise these and pass them on from generation to generation. This is how oral history was passed on until writing became a standard thing. They also had a powerful function in society. And Julius Caesar wrote about this um, in his journals when he was fighting against the Gauls that the, the Druids are where the power is at in Celtic society. Um, he told us about the roles of the, them and what they did. So they are seers then, so they, they do the mystical. They are poets, so they remember the, the stories of their people and pass them on. So that's about, that's about who you are. That's very, very important. They are judges within society. 
So if you have any quibbles or someone stole your chickens or someone has been getting in around your husband or your wife and you want to complain about it or someone's stealing your land, then the case would be resolved by the judge. So that puts the Druids as being quite up there in society. They are up there with the chiefs and the kings. They are important, respected figures. They are lore masters, so they remember um, the rules and the, the, the laws of their people, uh, the codes of what they live by. They are druids, they are priests, they are the pagan centre of their society. So that's what's there, this is the, the core of what it means to be uh, a Northern British person is embodied by these characters before the Christians come along. Language, um, in the early historic period there are three alphabets um, current. So Latin, which was brought by the Christian church, and that is a power in itself. If you are one of those few people at that time who could read it, that makes you, in the eyes probably of the average person, something of a wizard yourself. Uh, you have power to read these magical words that no one else has a scooby what they say, um, which gives you just the power of knowledge. Um, it makes you respected. You have something to bring to the community that not many people do have. So there's power in that in itself. That's brought by the Christian church. There's also Oum, which we can see an example on the top right on the Babel stone. So we have like a simple spine and then there are hashes or, or marks up to five at a time at different angles and lengths off that central line. We think a lot of this writing was done on wood, which is why so few examples of it obviously has kind of survived down to us. Um, in Dariada we have a, a few examples of that. There's one on a standing stone in Gia and there's some Ogham on or Oum on the inauguration slab on the top of Danad where the kings of Dalriada were, were crowned. Um, so that was originally developed by the Irish and it was taken on by the Scots and the Picts, um, well, not to the extent that it was used in Ireland. There's also runes that are brought in by the Scandinavians. We know the Scandinavians first come in recorded history to Iona to sack it and burn it in 795 AD. They bring their own system of writing with them and we find after the Vikings and Scandinavians basically come and raid and then begin to settle more and more runic items or individual pieces of paraphernalia with runes on them start to appear and can be found in the historical record and dug up by archaeologists. A ah, famous example of that would be the Hunterston brooch, brooch made for Dalriad and King but with runes inscribed on the back by the, the new powerhouse in western northern Britain uh, from the 9th century. Most people in the land however would have been illiterate, they would have been unable to read. So these markings, regardless of what language they're in, would have had a kind of magic. They'd understood that they meant something, but they wouldn't have been able to interpret them. So people who can, that gives you power. You can read the magic. Um, you have an ability that not many people do, and that would elevate you in society. So these churchmen, when they come in with this ability, um, having been schooled in monasteries, being able to read Latin, possibly being able to write Latin as well, that immediately gives them a little bit of like, ooh, mysticism, a bit of power, makes them stand out. So the arrival of the written word. In AD 563, as discussed earlier, Columbanese 12 Christian monks arrive in Kintyre from Ireland. Um, story goes that uh, Columba was given Iona by King Conal of Dalriada, his kinsman, and he established an abbey on the island. Now that's open to question as well. Um, King Conal may have only just recently conquered uh, Mull and Iona from the Picts, so possibly he is giving basically a bit of um, wild frontier land to Columba to go and settle on. Um, other stories go that it was actually the Picts that Columba uh, did a deal with and was given it by Brady up in Inverness. Um, but whoever gave him that land, that is where he ends up. There's also a bit of discussion that Iona was always a holy place and it was a Druid's island before Columba landed there and made it a Christian stronghold. So Iona would become the only centre of literacy in Northern Britain. They are making books, they are turning them out. They are reading Bibles, they are turning out Gospels, sections of Bibles, and over the centuries they're going to be responsible for some really gorgeous, gorgeous stuff that they're turning out. But they become a centre of this magic, they are spreading the word from Iona. The monks would study the Bible and they would copy texts. That's part of their job to work in the monastery. You want to get closer to the Lord by reading the word of the Lord. So most monks would have been able to read Latin um, to 
be able to do their job. Uh, and those with a bit of um, talent would have been working in the scriptorium, producing these books. You want the word to spread if you're a Christian. You want to make more people Christian. And to do so, you need the word to spread. So more of these Bibles need to be copied out, written, spread across the land. Grumba's role as a learned holy man leads him to be given intertribal diplomatic duties. Now, we know he was at the Convention of Drum Set, which was a meeting of many of the, the kings of Ireland uh, in Northern Ireland. Um, and Columba seems to have worked as a mediator between all the different kings. The church has respect in Northern British society, certainly in the kind of Irish-based, Scots-based ones, uh, where Christianity was established. They look up to the church. They are already entwined with secular power. So a powerful churchman, particularly one that comes himself from a royal family from Ireland, is going to engender respect. So Columba has a role not just as a churchman, but as a kind of international diplomat. We also have examples of kings of uh, Clute or Dumbarton. Um, basically, King Rudrich Hale in the late 6th century writes to Columba to ask him if things were cool between him and King Aidan of Dalriada after the two had had um, a bit of a sticky fallout. And Columba apparently wrote back to say that uh, Roger Hale would die an old man in his bed, indicating that Aidan wasn't going to come and stomp on his head and destroy his kingdom. So Columba has a role here. Um, he is a big hitter, a big player in Northern British society during his time as Abbot of Iona. Now, looking at Iona today, if you go and visit the site, the abbey you can see in the top right is a Benedictine one. That is not anything to do with the Columban Church. That actually created quite a lot of controversy um, when they built the place. Um, and what you see today is itself restored in Victorian times. It was a roofless shell until the 1890s when they, they put the thing back together again. Um, the map of the compound, um, you possibly can see the kind of shaded earthworks on the top left and the bottom right. The whole area itself, quite large, is oval. Most early Christian compounds um, have a oval or circular set of grounds round about them, bounded by a vallum or a kind of like ridge in a ditch. And this shows the kind of sacred precinct around the holy site. Now, Ewan Campbell interpreted the layout of Iona as being quite close to the layout of uh, Jerusalem. So when you go to the Holy Sepulchre, you go to the heart of Christianity and the Holy Land, and you see the layout of the different um, key parts of the, the kind of holy geography there, um, Iona and the precinct here is supposed to mimic that. A wee bit more about that later on. So on the bottom right there, we've got St. Martin's Cross, which is the oldest surviving um, Columban cross, um, Celtic cross style, on the site. A lot of them were smashed by the Vikings or looted by later occupants in Iona. On the bottom left, we can see the Relic Oran, which is the graveyard of the kings of Northern Britain. The last king of Northern Britain who is in there is Macbeth, as in, yes, Shakespeare's Macbeth, that one, um, who died in 1058. Kenneth MacAlpine, the first apparent king of Scotland, he was buried there too. So, some famous people in there. Um, and then on the top left, you can see an aerial view of the site from above. So, this is the place where Columba was. I find it fascinating in history where we can pinpoint a space where these big historical characters lived and existed and did their thing. St. Columba, we know, lived on Iona. We know that he's at the heart of this community and he set this up. Um, so to go there, you're literally standing in the footsteps of the, this famous man, um, which for me is, is, is fascinating. So what was the impact of the written word? Now, the written word becomes like a truth that could not be changed. With oral history, it can change in every telling. There can be a slight difference in it. Or it can be remembered differently as it's passed from person to person. It can go through changes, a bit like the game of Chinese whispers is a truth that could be changed. The written word is different because every time you read that word, it's going to say the same thing. So that, um, I guess, gives it its own magic again. And being able to read those words makes you a powerful person in the community. So monks, priests became the guardians of this truth 
and no one else could access it. They become the new seers, the new privileged holy people in the community. Books become objects of power, revered and finely decorated. I find that in itself fascinating as well, that books are so rare in this time, and the effort and the money that goes into producing these things makes them treasured, treasured artifacts for any society to be to be looked after at all costs. These are, books are possibly the most viable thing that would be in any individual community if they had them. Um, whereas today when books are just so ubiquitous, they're everywhere, you can go to the book depot and pick one up for less than a pound. They're just cheap and disposable. But in the sixth, in the seventh century, books are fabulous, fabulous items uh, to be treasured. And let's have a look at those books and what that means. So right now to Columba. Monks of Iona used Columba's books as props to perform miracles. Writings may have even been attributed to him, but he didn't actually do. And the Katak is one of these books that are attributed to Columba. Now that is a picture of its case down the bottom left. This is apparently written by Columba himself. Incredible. It is the second oldest surviving Latin manuscript in the British Isles. It's kept in Dublin today. And this on the right hand side is a photograph of one of the pages. So it's dated to round about the, the last decade of Columba's life. He died in 597. So we think it was written in the 590s AD. It is the, the first book from Scotland, or what will become Scotland, um, and it has the beginnings of elaborate decoration. You can see in the, the page that I've taken on the right hand side there, he's starting to draw some fancy letters on his page. Now this is called Illumination. And in the next decades after this book comes along, the monks of Iona are going to pick up this idea and they are going to run with it. So they're going to produce some just beautiful artwork. Um, the book was taken to Ireland and it is put in a shrine and carried into battle. There's a shrine here uh, to bring good luck. And Katak actually means the battler. So one of the minor kingdoms of Ireland, they used this book as a kind of good luck charm. Every time they went into a fight, someone would carry it and it was like a totem for them. Um, so this shows a movement towards illuminated manuscripts, coloured dots and large letters, small crosses. So they are taking something that admittedly could look less than exciting if it's just rows and rows of script. And you can see there are no full stops on there. There do not appear to be many gaps between the words. Grammar is something that comes along a bit later on um, in terms of how we would recognise things being written down. So at this stage, we are still very, very much early doors. Uh, in the world of writing. Now, illuminated manuscripts end up looking like this. Now, the writing after Columba, these are the illuminated gospels. Produced most likely in Iona, they show the resources and the wealth that the church had amassed. Now, think about the difference in the page I just showed you from Columba's book to this stuff. Now, the Book of Duro is an example. It was taken to Ireland, put in a shrine and carried into battle, just like Columba's Katak to bring luck. The text includes the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Now, the Bible, the New Testament, the Old Testament are massive works. If you were to pick one up today, it would be printed probably in quite small text and the pages would be super thin and the book itself would still be very chunky. The monks are writing this stuff by hand. Their pages are not as thin as modern paper that can be turned out and a Bible would be enormous. So they're not able to turn out full Bibles because it would take like a two grown people to carry the thing. So they are turning out Gospels. So it's individual Gospel sections from the Bible um, that they're getting uh, produced here. So um, the text here in the Book of Duro includes the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. It contains large illumination uh, program including six excellent carpet pages. Um, and an example of a carpet page is, well there are two here is where there is no, um, well, there's not much script and it's mostly just pattern and pictures, as we can see here, representing usually one of the saints or some aspects of, of the Bible. Um, so a full-page miniature of the four evangelist symbols are in the Book of Duro. There are four full-page miniatures, each containing a single evangelist symbol and six pages with significant decorated initials and text. Now, the investment to make one of these pages is enormous. So this is really the church showing its wealth, showing its prestige of like, hey guys, look what we have done. This is amazing. Now remember the churches, the monasteries 
are in a way almost kind of competing at this time. It's like they're showing each other what we can do. So it builds up the prestige of a church if they can produce something like this because people are going to want to come and see it. And when pilgrims come and visit your church, they're going to pay you money to stay. They're going to make offerings to the church, which is going to help your church grow its power and grow its wealth. So you want to have treasures that people are going to come and see. So you want to show off. So the Book of Kells is another famous example of one of these early texts. It's four Gospels. Um, it represents a year's labour for a monk. And in terms of the financial investment to make it, 185 calves were needed to write that book. Now we've spoken a bit about this before. Books are made from leather or the leather of calves stretched out thinly and cut into page size. That material is called vellum. They want to do it with calves because the skin thickens and it can get discoloration and blemishes and marks and older cows. Um, so to produce 185 calves, we're looking at a herd of at least 600 cattle being needed. That is a lot. Now, in the early medieval period, coinage isn't really re-established yet. Um, when the Romans left, coinage kind of collapsed with them and disappeared, and it became cattle that wealth was dependent on. So 600 cattle represents a massive amount of money, a massive amount of wealth. So you're basically liquidating your wealth to make this book if you're producing an illuminated manuscript. To colour the thing, they're using orpiment, which needs to be uh, traded in from the Mediterranean, and lapis lazuli, that's the blue colour, that needs to come from Afghanistan. Now, that's incredible. So they are shipping pigments from Central Asia all the way to the edge of Europe to make this book. The value of that is mind-boggling. So for the monastery itself, to possess this is a massive prestigious thing um, for anyone to come and take it, as we're going to find out from one of our later units. Also quite a huge deal. So it's not just the Bibles that they are illustrating and reproducing, um, they're also working on other uh, pieces of writing. So the newly composed writings that are being produced, they have a bigger impact on the secular world, so the non-religious world. Now remember, these monks are educated people. Um, some of them who come into the church are going to come from noble backgrounds as well, Columba being an example. So they have a foot in either camp. So they are going to be big and important in the church because they, if they come from a noble family, they're probably bringing wealth with them and influence with them when they come in. And they still have those connections outside the church too. So educated people are able to spread their ideas, spread their learning, spread their thoughts back into the secular world. So an example of this, we have The Life of St. Columba. It's a book that was written by a donna. So it propelled Columba to international fame. It is something called hagiography. Now we've encountered that before in our course when we talked about Tacitus's book on Agricola. So hagiography is a biography that's going to tell us just the good stuff. And the purpose of it is to enhance the reputation of its subject. Now, Domnan was an abbot of Iona um, who's writing in the 660s AD. So he's uh, in charge around about 60 to 70 years after Columba has gone. Um, he wouldn't personally have known Columba. He would have been born after Columba was gone. But it's going to pay for him to big up the founder of his monastery. So if he wants to increase the reputation of the monastery where he works at Iona, he is going to want to make its founder the most holy of the holy. So that's kind of what Adonis sets out to do. He's basically writing a big PR story for the founder of his church. So Adonis' political message is he used Old Testament kings to promote a political model of the church and the kings supporting each other, which is going to be useful for the world he lives in because it's going to make his church, his monastery Iona, more important because he wants the kings of Pickland and the kings of Dalriada to look to him to answer the questions about what they do and how they act. Uh, and therefore, obviously, that would um, attract investment and prestige from the non-religious world to his church. In his book, he wanted to ordain uh, new kings as Columbus' successor, Iona, and he invented the story of Columba choosing Aden over his brothers when it came time to choose the next king of Dalriana back in 575. Um, he also wrote the Locus Sanctus, uh, which is basically a geography of the, the holy centre in Jerusalem. The sepulchre, the geography of how it's all laid out and so on. Uh, 
Um, interestingly, though, um, it was one of the most relied upon guidebooks um, uh, to the Holy Land by pilgrims, and it was widely researched, but Adomnan never, ever went there. So for basing the actual geography of the Monastery of Iona on this uh, idea he had of what it looked like over there, he himself had never been. It was based on his own research. He also did the Collectico Canonum Hibernensis, which is Adomnan's work uh, forming the basis for church law throughout Europe for hundreds of years. So Adomnan was able to use the prestige of his monastery's founder, Columba, and he built on that, and he was wickedly successful. And also as a hard-working, um, very obviously educated man, it meant that it attracted attention to his other works too, and he was able to spread his influence and the influence of the church in Iona. The Donna went on to produce the Cain Adomnan, or the Law of Innocence, in AD 697. It was an attempt to establish and implement an international declaration of human rights, um, trying to protect non combatants during war. It was agreed by over 50 Irish kings, remember, as I said earlier on, Ireland is just a sack of little individual warring kingdoms who are always, it seems, fighting with each other. So a surprising number of kings there. But at this conference, they all kind of came together, um, along with the King of the Picts and the King of Dalriada. And in that law it says that women may not be killed by a man in any way, neither by slaughter, or by any other death, nor by poison, nor by water, nor by fire, nor by beast, nor in a pit, nor by dogs, but shall die in their own lawful bed. This story apparently came about after Adomnan paid a visit across to some of the kings of the Picts and he encountered a battlefield and on that battlefield he saw a child, a toddler, crying next to his dead mother and he was horrified by what he saw. And until that point it seems that women had equality in Pictland and could turn up on the battlefield and fight just as easily as the men. Um, Adomnan uh, was horrified by the consequences of this these women didn't have childcare for someone to look after their wee kiddo uh, while they're all fighting, so the battle might be the battle. The child might be strapped to their back while they went into the fight, and that's what he ended up seeing. And after that, they agreed on it, and women were excluded from warfare from that point on in Northern Britain. So, hey, Dominic, thanks for bringing sexism. So, writing then spread out with the church as well. So, the kings get savvy to the power of writing. And we see an embodiment of this in a document called the Sensius Fern Album. Now, the author is unknown, but it's probably either a cleric or at least someone who's trained in the monastery that put the thing together. It was impossible to do without writing, and it signified the beginnings of state bureaucracy, of taxes and control. What the Sensius Fern Album is, is basically a census of the kingdom of Dalriada. So it lists all the domains within the kingdom, and it lists their obligations, so who they have to send if the king calls out the army to go to war. So um, it tells you how many men are supposed to serve, how many boats they're supposed to bring to the royal army. And from this document, we're basically able to work out what the population of Dariada was at that time and what their fighting force was that they could turn out. Now, that can't happen without writing. It is also a symbol of a... Uh, a bureaucracy, so there's um, an, a power of authority going on within this kingdom, and layers of control um, that are quite quite sophisticated for the time. So with the census for Nalban, um, the king does not therefore need to rely on nobles to gather tax. He's got the legal documents to say how many people will live where. He knows how much money they have to pay, so it gives the king power. They also created king lists. So it's easier for future kings to manipulate to suit their own purposes. We have a list of the kings of Dalriada that goes quite far back. We need to be careful of this list because later kings will go in and they would insert fictitious kings into the histories that they could link to their own lineage. And the point of that was that it built prestige for those later claimants. If you come to the throne and you can say, 200 years ago, my great-great-great-great-grandfather used to be the king as well, then it gives you um, authority, it gives you a pedigree, and it encourages people to believe that you actually do have a right to become the king. So we do have these lists, but we do need to be careful about the names that are put in there. So a bit of historiography, Ewan Campbell says, the written word is much more powerful than oral accounts as a record of the past, and until recent times, these early traditions were taken at face value. That's an important point. If you think about when we studied earlier on the course, um, Tacitus' Agricola, the Agricola and the events in Agricola were taken as just 
fact until um, possibly the kind of mid 20th century when people started to think, hang on a minute, Tacitus might not be telling us the full story here. Uh, and it was very easy for us to just take, well, this is an ancient source, someone's written it down, it's fact. Um, but there's a lot of, lot of work being done uh, in the last 50 years, especially in the last kind of like 20 years, on pulling these ancient sources apart and looking at the layers of meaning and what's going on. There's a, a PhD and a doctor in there alone just analysing individual sources to find out what's happening. So the other power outside the power of the written word is the power of image. Not everyone can read. In fact, the majority of people could not read. So the church needs another way to convey their message outside of the, the magic of the word. And this power is going to come through image. So the need for imagery then. The illiterate population need to be talked to by the church if they're going to be won over. So preachers would find it difficult to show large crowds the books they were preaching from. This is part of the magic and appeal of the Christian church. They need to spread all their stories, all their ideas of the power of God. They can't hold up a page in front of class or in front of the congregation and point to something that's tiny that the, the folk in the, the third row back uh, has no way of seeing. Uh, so they need something else. So crosses develop, like the example here, uh, to not only signify Christianity, but also to show biblical stories to illustrate their sermons. We can imagine Priests ring in the, the priest bell. We get examples of these giant bells. They look like massive cow bells. Um, and they would have been heard for some distance away. These things are huge. You imagine the priest ringing their big bell, the congregation in the local hamlet or village turning up, coming meeting their priest to be waiting, and he would tell them a story while standing next to one of these carved crosses. And he'd be able to point to different carvings and pictures on the cross and relate the story of what was going on and then link it probably to something that's happening in the community at that time or an idea that they wanted to share. It's so called parables. So we get an example here of Daniel in the lion's den from the moonstone, and we can see a character being pulled apart by big beasties on the other side. So you point to that picture, and that is like your comic strip box uh, uh, that the priest could then go and relate the story of the lion's den and how they're related to what you wanted to talk about at the time. So we've got the imagery on these high crosses. Another example of imagery is the imagery of the writing of text. Text itself has power, remember. This is a scribe pe pebble from Danad, the royal centre of the king of Dariada. Um, it's dated, it's difficult with something that is purely just stone uh, to date it. So the date window is a bit big here, but AD 600 through to 800. This disc has an incised Latin inscription in a cursive script, so that means handwritten, uh, which reads, in the name of a nominee. So, this is Latin, and it is shorthand for the Lord's Prayer. In nomine patri, e fili, e spiritus sancti, which means in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. This may have belonged to a cleric working at the royal palace. This shows that people are in Danad, have writing, can read, are making things of script, the recording information for the king. This information could have been taken back to Iona and artistically recorded uh, for posterity or to spread the prestige of the king. It shows that there's a close relationship between secular power and religious power going on at Danad and going on within the kingdom of Dalriada. The church and writing bring power and that's going to be useful to the king to spread his authority. So other examples of imagery, we've got high crosses. Now, um, if you go and visit the Sanctuary of Iona today, uh, you'll find a room with this in it on the right-hand side. This is St John's Cross, and it was smashed into fragments. On the left-hand side there, we can see what used to be left. Now, since um, the ooh, 1970, I believe it went up, they made a concrete um, cast of the fragments and artistically kind of filled in the gaps. And they re-erected this um, replica outside in front of the Benedictine Abbey. So when you see a big cross that looks a bit like the one on the right-hand side without the gaps in it, that is a concrete reproduction, although it does look very, very realistic. So that's St John's Cross, but it gives you an idea of the artistry that was going on in these things. So the original is from Iona in the 8th century. Um, it's one of the earliest with a Celtic ring. Now these are added to support the arms of the cross after they broke under their own weight. These things are made out of stone. We think originally these carved crosses easier for carpenters to make out of wood and then when the church is uh, wanting to um, show its prestige its power 
show its uh, permanence. They're going to transform this medium into stone to make it last longer. Um, but the medium of stone doesn't have the flexibility and the strengths of wood and these arms of this cross are not going to stay there. So this circle we see around the cross could be structural. Um, also, it's been suggested that the circle is another example of the early uh, Celtic church incorporating pagan ideas. So the circle could represent sun deities, those who worship the sun. They've taken that and bought it in to the Christian faith. So um, the sun is becoming the light of God, um, but they incorporate the imagery, the disc symbol of the sun, into their cross. Sometimes these are called pagan crosses. So these early high crosses had rings inserted later, it says, with mortise and tenon joints, suggesting that they were originally made of wood. Now we're going to see that the different mediums that these things are made in can um, affect how the thing looks. So another cross on the site of Iona is St Martin's Cross. This is probably the earliest surviving uh, example that's in one piece. It shows a biblical scene of David choosing the temple musicians and you can see just the artistry on this is, is incredible. Lots of stuff there for the priest to point to and use as a preaching stone. It's interlaced decoration is copied from metal work um, and illustrated manuscripts. So they're taking the ideas of what the monks are drawing on their fabulous gospels and obviously you're going to keep them nice, you're not going to bring them out in the wind and the rain. Um, and they're very, very precious objects, especially as time passes. You're not going to be getting them out every day just to show the, the crowd. So if you can take scenes from that and put it on a cross outside that is much more accessible to the ordinary pilgrims, that makes it easier for the, the priests to be um, a bit less exclusive and to more easily spread the word, more access to the people, to the, the magic of the church. And when it's coming across into stone again from a different medium. So we think they were making them in wood originally. They're bringing in ideas of artwork that have been reproduced first on metal or on vellum, and they're now putting these into stone. This is where we start to get these fabulous um, fusions of artwork. So the elaborate crosses, you can see come from metal work, interlaced decoration, figures from manuscripts with the illuminated um, designs and styles and the structure of the crosses comes from carpentry, from working with wood. Some more examples there. So there's layers of meaning going on with these crosses. Now, I talked earlier on about how you should get yourself a PhD in just analysing ancient texts and pulling apart. You could get a PhD in analysing these things too. Now, they will cover in the panels, and you can see on the sides of this cross over on the right hand side here, and we got Daniel in the lion's den down the bottom. Um, as an example, there are key scenes from the Bible, but they are vaguely designed to be able to represent numerous points of scripture. So they could represent different ideas or themes or tropes from different parts of the Bible. And that means each one of these little boxes could be useful for a different individual sermon that the priest might want to give. Interlaced animal design may have been for protection. That's a kind of pagan idea uh, to guard the cross against evil. So they are, I remember, always kind of incorporating the old-fashioned pagan ideas and pulling them through into Christianity and making them on their own. But when we see these interlaced beasts, like we see on the left-hand side here, this is probably borrowed from pagan ideas. And we see a lot of that on the, the Pictish slab stones as well. Um, they're a wee bit slower, possibly, to adopt Christianity, and we see there's a lot more kind of pagan stuff on the, on the Pictish stone carving. But they love a intertwined beastie. So... To finish off, Ewan Campbell, and the reason I've used him all the way through this is Ewan Campbell produced a book called Saints and Sea Kings in the late 1990s, and he's the one that really um, comes out with the idea that the Dalriadans were always indigenous and always based in Argyll and did not come across the sea and migrate from Ireland. He's done a career's worth of work on Dalriada and what's going on there, and he's still producing stuff now. Um, there are loads of videos uh, being produced on YouTube, actually, by the University of Glasgow about Ewan Campbell's work at the moment. In fact, they did a season on his work in the last few months of 2020. So you can check out some more information about his stuff there. And when we go on to look at Dariada and the ideas of kingship, he's done a lot of work on that site. So we'll be looking more into his work too. But to round off here, a historiographical sorry, comment on the impact of Christianity. He says, Christianity bought that new ideas, artifacts and technologies which were to contribute to the transformation of not just the inner landscape of the mind, but also the outer physical landscape and even the ways in which people related to each other. Christianity is intrinsic 
to what Dariada is and what it becomes. It shapes the landscape for them, it shapes the language of power, it shapes what they do. Christianity and secular power in Danad, in all the different Kenela, and the idea of what Dariada is are all intertwined. Christianity is the language of power in Dariada. Um, and you can't really talk about Dariada without talking about what the Christians did and what St. Columba did in their past. Alright, that's it for today. Uh, we're going to move on to look at kingship, culture and power in the next video. That's all for today. Thank you.